Hello and welcome to The Huddle. Liam Santa Maria back with you. And uh, well, we're three weeks in to the NBL season and there's a lot going on. Jesse Wagstaff is in hot water for a terrace screen that, that just went a little awry. Uh, Peyton Siever signed uh, as a new import, according to reports. And three teams in particular, the Tasmania Jack Jumpers, New Zealand Breakers, and the Cairns Taipans coming off undefeated round three performances. And the Taipans, well, they have, they're coming off a particularly big one, a win over Sydney, uh, bouncing back from a home loss to Perth. And uh, to break all of that down, I've got Shannon Scott on the show today. He was massive in that game. 16 points, six rebounds, five assists, four steals, and um, a very classy post-game interview with Joe Healy. So sit back, relax. Up next, Shannon Scott. Shannon, what's happening, mate? Good to see you. And thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be on here. Good stuff. How's uh, how's life in far north Queensland? It's good, man. Uh, I have a hoodie on right now. It's kind of very misleading, but I like to keep my place really cold because of how hot it is outside. So, I mean, yeah, it's just hot, you know, getting used to this. This heat, this temperature right now is the main thing, but, man, it's good out here, and I'm loving it. The humidity is the thing that takes a little getting used to. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I, I didn't – they keep warning me that's not even – where it's going to get to in January, but uh, I'm already starting to feel it for sure. Hey, mate, um, three and one start for you guys. Um, 40 in the post game press of the other night was talking about, hey, we're not going to ride any roller coaster up and down and buying into any media narratives about how we're going. So let's hear from you. I mean, how do you assess the start to the season for you guys? Mm. Oh, yeah. I mean, honestly, I thought we had a pretty good start. Uh, a lot of guys have been doing a lot of different things on the court and been contributing in different ways. And I think that was make us the hardest team to, to plan against. Um, we don't have that guy that's going to give you 50 points on a given night, but we have a bunch of guys that can contribute in different ways. And with doing that, I think it's pretty hard to game plan against us. And I feel like that's kind of been that, that separation that we've been having, um, fortunately. So if we can keep that mindset, not having guys get selfish, um, everybody playing together, I think we're going to be doing pretty well at the end of the year. Have you got a read yet on, on like the Taipans historically? What kind of franchise you've joined? What the fact that they're a bit of a small market team and, and where they sit in the landscape of the NBL? Yeah, I mean, I knew uh, last year didn't go ideally as, as planned. Um, I know basically that that image of the team is kind of this year coming in was kind of like, can they bounce back from last year? Can they, um, can they be a team that's competing with other teams, just being out on the court, but you know, giving other teams troubles so I mean I think for us going into the season we all heard about that we know we're not naive we know how the energy was and um our biggest thing was we want to get the fans behind us we want to uh to lead to respect us the same way as the other teams so mm -hmm. we go out there and play hard every time I mean 40's biggest thing is if we go out there and just play hard whatever results happen we're going to live with but we just can't go out there and not play hard and then if we lose after that then we have to look ourselves in the mirror and figure out what we're doing wrong it's been a really cool fan base over the journey yeah. Like that's a, that's a fan base that always packs out Ken's convention center and gets right behind that team, win, lose or draw. And, uh, but Forty's right. Like he's been talking a bit last season, like we've got to, we've got to reward those fans by giving them a team that brings it every single yeah. time on the floor. Yeah, absolutely. And even with our, um, our previous Perth game, the game got, it got behind us, honestly, we got down by 20 points and it was playing a great team like that. It's tough to, you know, get them out of their rhythm, tough to come back on a team like that. But our biggest thing, probably about second half of like eight minutes left was we're going to keep fighting to the end. We're not going to just give in and just let the fans see us give up on our home court. So, I mean, um, yeah, we're, we're taking a lot of pride in that. We definitely want to do better for them. But, um, yeah, we want to make sure we, no matter what, home or away, we're going to give it our all. Have you looked up into those rafters in Cairns and seen what's missing up there? There's no championships, I know that. I, I do. I'm very aware of that. So, I mean, obviously that's completely down the road for us and we have so many hurdles we got to get to to get there, but obviously we would love to put a, a banner up there. I mean, I think that'd be great for the city, great for the recognition of the city and the NBL world as well. Well, you talk about, um, everyone always talks about taking it one game at a time. So let's talk about that last game because it, it was a big win. Previously undefeated, defending champs on their home floor. You always want to bounce back 
after a loss and you guys did that in really impressive fashion what what was your kind of favorite element of what you guys got done on the weekend oh man i mean there's a lot of little things i really enjoyed about that that last win but i think the biggest thing for us was the way that we lost against per um 20, 25 points. I don't know the, the final score of it. And then going into Sydney, a great team like that that has such great players and um, great organization, all that. You can easily let your team slip away by just losing a game like that and letting it compound to the next game. And then after that Perth game was over, we talked about it, we reviewed it. And then we put it behind us and we got ready for Sydney. And uh, we didn't let our last game determine how we were going to play for the following game. Sydney was a completely different environment for us. We played well together. We played on selfish. Uh, I think that probably caught them off guard as well. You, you see a team that got kicked down and knocked in the face. You, they wanted to do the same thing, but we, we responded really well that game. So that's my biggest thing for us. We're able to respond well when we hit adversity. And as long as we can keep doing that in a league like this, we're going to be fine. Coach Ford used to coach that squad. Not sure if you know him. Was he, was he up and about behind closed doors? Uh, I mean, he, he was definitely... Um, Definitely wanted that win, but I mean, Forty doesn't show down his face, man. I know he's very animated on the sideline, but at the end of the day, for him and for us, each win is a win. It doesn't matter if we're playing the first place team or last place, like last ranked team. Um, we have to find a way to win games in this league. It's a very tough league. It's it's such a, a narrow margin between each team. So I mean, despite who we're playing, um, their history, how they're doing this year, you have to find a way to win each and every game. Well, one way that you've found to do that, I mean, there's been a lot of attention on the fact that he recruited a bunch of shooters and that you guys are dangerous on the perimeter. But man, the defense, I mean, you kept Sydney to 78 in that game across their other four games so far this season, they're averaged 100. And you talked about how talented they are and how dangerous they are. The defense, I thought, was, was really impressive, not only in that one, but in those other wins as well. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. I mean, when I when I when I first talked to Coach Forty uh, way back a few months ago, his first question was, "How was I doing?" and "How's how's my defense?" And I'm pretty sure he uh, he came to everybody that came in this year with that same approach. Um, I didn't. I haven't watched a lot of games from last year and how they played, but talking with Taj, talking with KP, I knew the defense wasn't their main their main uh, mindset. And mm-hmm. Forty made that very clear all throughout preseason that we're going to defend teams. We might we can go 0 for 50 from the three-point land, but at the end of the day, we're going to defend teams. I don't care if the score is 49 to 50, we're going to defend teams. And right. I think that's going to be our identity for sure. I mean, we're able to play that up-tempo fastball when we're defending and playing well on defense. So we understand what ignites that and what gets us going. And I think everybody wants to play that up-tempo type of game. So for us to get to that point, we got to defend well. We got to be together on defense. And we did a great job with that. And I think, I don't know, but watching you guys, I, I get the sense you're starting to develop a, a style defensively. Um, we always talk about di- what teams have different styles at the offensive end, but teams yeah. also at the defensive end, you know, where there's teams like Tasmania who, um, you know, you always hear Scott Roth, you now solid, stay solid, stay solid. Whereas for you guys, I feel about it's, it's all about disruption. You know, you've got so many long athletes. I mean, you've got DJ Hogg, 6'9", at the small forward spot. Majuk Deng, Bull Kual, Taj, of course, Keanu. And I think you can see it here in the early going. You lead the league in steals. You're the only team averaging double-figure steals per game. You've got three guys individually, you, DJ, and Taj, in the top five for steals per game. Bull Kual's averaging a steal as well. I mean, is that part of the the approach for you guys defensively to get in those lanes and be disruptive? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I don't think we even knew those statistics. I think we just, um, the way we play defense is is playing together. And I think something that's mis, uh, I don't know, it's misconstrued out here, but like you don't have to be picking up a full 94 feet to be playing pressure deep and you can pick and choose where you want to do it. And I think we do a great job with that. Um, we have guys that can't pick up 94 for sure, but there's other times in the game we, we do our scouting. We understand the other players' personnel. It's not just having to be rah-rah on the ball all the time. We know what guys like to do. We kind of plan for what we want to do. So, And when we get to the game time, we prepare for every situation. So we have an understanding and idea where the ball is going to be at, where, where the uh, offender is trying to get to on the court. And I think that's what puts us in a um, position to make these steals and all that. So I would love to say that we all have so much energy and we're just all over the place and we're just – playing hard every single time but I think our coaches have done a great job of putting us in position to be 
successful defensively. And um, as long as we keep doing that, the results will happen. All right. Well, speaking of those coaches, let, let's talk a little bit about Coach Ford because he's a, he's a great character within this league. How are you enjoying playing for him so far? Uh, yeah, man, I love it, honestly. I mean, he's probably he's one of my favorite coaches already. Um, I think he he's done a great job with myself and with this team, but it's given us confidence. And picking up what we talked about earlier about this team and the rotation that we had, he wanted to make sure that we understood that this team was not last year's team and this season is not last year's season. Despite of what happened last year, we're not going to let that determine what's going to happen this year. And he put so much confidence in his guys and all of us. I don't think anybody on the court goes out there thinking, what should I be doing? Um, he makes it very clear that how he wants us to play and the freedom that he gives us. And I think that helps everybody excel for sure. He's, um, the thing I love about 40 is like, there's, there's layers to him, mm -hmm. you know, as you get yeah. to know him a little deeper, like talk me through that process for you. I mean, he's, he's a hard on the sleeve type of guy, but you see that like the, the finger tats are poking yeah. out underneath the shirt and then you get, you get to know him and he's a real, like he's such a hard worker in terms yeah. of punching the data and scouting opponents and, and the like. I mean, how has the process yeah. been for you in kind of getting to know this guy? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, and that's something that I picked up on really quickly. You know, uh, obviously when you're being recruited by a guy, you talk to him on the phone, you just hear this professional man and just, you know, <laughs> straight to business there's no joking around it's like this is what we want to do this is our game plan all that right then i get a then i get a picture and see an interview of him and i see like you said the tattoos and all that stuff I'm like that's not who i thought i was talking to on the phone you know it's somebody completely different so uh that's one thing and then when we get to the gym and we're just hanging out and talking around and he puts his sunglasses on he puts his music on and you just feel him it looks like he's about to go run into a wall, honestly. I mean, I don't right. know what music he's playing and just all this stuff. But yeah, it just there's so many different, like you said, different layers of him. But um, but yeah, man, it's really amazing. It's not like when you're around him at the airport or at a hotel, you're like, oh man, my, my head coach is coming. I gotta, you know, change my attitude or anything like that. Just be able to be who we are um 24-7 with him. And I think that makes everybody feel comfortable no matter what the situation is. And when it comes to game time, when it comes to scouting, he knows exactly what he's talking about. He, um, he's done his research, he's done his coaching, he's done his um, due, due diligence and trying to figure out what he wants everybody to do and what our game plan is, and he sticks to it. So we understand that how his approach is and how he wants to talk about things, and when it gets to that time where he's teaching, we're all just heads in, just listening to him. You're aware that he used to work in the prison system? No, I didn't know that, but what... <laughs> Yeah, I, that makes a little bit more sense now. I mean, uh, <laughs> I, I can see the, the type of the type of mentality that he has. I can definitely see that. So, yeah, I, I was not aware of that. I think yeah, he nah, might have purposely let that out when he starts recruiting players. Yeah, no, nah, he's seen it all, man. <laughs> like, nobody's going to come and try and be a tough guy with, with Coach Ford. Let yeah, me tell you. I, I see that now. Yeah, and that's good to know. Uh, um, I don't know. I don't know if the whole team knows that yet, but that's definitely good to know. <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, I, I want to ask you about one of your teammates, man. Like uh, you're obviously playing, like you were talking about a whole bunch of guys playing at a really high level to start this season, but Keanu Pinder, mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if you're fully across like his journey, most improved player in the league last season. He, he went from five and four in his first season, 11 and seven last season and just really found a home. Man, 17 and 10 thus far in this this early part of the season. What what have been your early impressions of, of Keanu as a teammate? Yeah, man, that, that motor is different. Um, I think that that's going to separate him from a lot of guys right now and throughout his whole career. His motor is, is really um, amazing, and it's contagious for us for sure. I mean, we see him in practice, especially on tough days that we had where uh, – Guys are, guys are kind of you know sluggish and don't want to really go as hard and we see him down there banging and trying to tip dunk you and offensive rebound and all that stuff it's like wow I'm, i gotta pick it up now because of how hard he's going so i mean i mean he's, he's playing great and obviously we want to keep putting him in a position to play great because when he does the things that he does it makes all of our lives easier hey um one of the things a lot of people here might not know about you is uh your your basketball pedigree now we, we make a big deal here about like um, about Chase Buford and his father and and being a, a legendary NBA executive. We've had like a guy like David Stockton playing yeah. this league, son of John Stockton. But I think a lot of people might not realize how much of a legend of the game your dad is. Mm -hmm. um, now, so for those who 
who aren't aware, is Naismith Hall of Famer, um, NBA champion, NBA all-star multiple times, Olympic gold medalist. Mm -hmm. And perhaps what he's most known for is being a University of North Carolina legend, first African-American scholarship holder at Mm -hmm. UNC. Um, Now, you were born in 1992. He retired and hung the boots up in 1980, right? Like a decade. Yeah, way before that. So, so <laughs> at what point in your life did you start to get a real sense of what your dad had achieved in the game and in the in a social and a cultural sense around the game? Yeah, um, okay, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, growing up, like you said, he he got done playing way before I was born. So, uh, growing up, I'm around a bunch of. NBA All-Star Hall of Famers, and I'm not realizing who they are because I'm young. So I'm just, you know, around Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, around like, you know, the Kimmy Matumbo. I'm just, you know, just walking around like, high five, man, it is what it is. And I'm just not understanding who that is. And I don't understand how important my, my, my pops is and his impact of the game because I'm just assuming everybody's dad is the same, you know? That's my dad. He, he birthed me. He's, I go home, I see him every day. So I don't right. really understand that until uh, I want to say – probably about seven, eight years old. Uh, it really started clicking for me that people were kind of, you know, looking up to this guy. People were kind of, you know, when they get to see him, he's signing stuff, signing autographs and all that. Um, I think that's probably the time period where I realized what he's been doing. And I started asking my family a little bit more about what's going on. And then I started looking at his awards. I started looking at his pictures and saying that this isn't this, you know, your average guy that's it's in my household. I mean, he's actually have done something with his life and his career. And I kind of, you know, start picking up on things and then, you know, try to emulate what he does after that. Start asking him more questions and, you know, trying to, you know, be more heads on with that. But um, yeah, I mean, it was at a, at a somewhat young age, probably second grade, third grade, where I'm like, something's a little different about my dad than this guy at school's dad next to me. I mean, people are asking him for autograph, why not him? People are stopping him in the store. People are pulling over to see him in Carolina, but I don't know why they're doing that. I just thought it was like a friendly thing. So yeah, right. I mean, um, it's it definitely made an impact in my life and definitely something I picked up on when I was young, but uh, definitely didn't know at first for sure. So, so I'm picturing like Dr. J, Spencer Highwood, yeah. these kind of guys like at the house. Yeah, yeah. And I have no idea that it's just my dad's friends to me. That's just, you know, <laughs> it's just, you know, it's just a regular day, regular day at the house, man. They come over to eat, you know, hanging out at All-Star Game. I'll, we was actually joking around about it uh, last holidays with our family. I was like, you know, I've never been to the fair. I mean, and they're like, what are you talking about? I'm like, I've never been to the fair. Like, I've never been to a state fair. I got like Funnel K, rode like the, the elephant or something like that, like right. the feather pigs. I mean, I was like, yeah, because you're at All Star Weekend, you don't know where you're at. So we're just, you know, you're at NBA All Star Weekend with the celebrities and stuff, but you don't realize what you're doing because you're a young kid. So right. I, I, don't, I don't know what's going on. I'm just going through the motions because I'm a young kid and just thinking that this is just normal. But reality looking back on it wasn't normal at all so i mean it's just you know it's a, it's a weird environment but mm. now looking back on it, it's like yeah man I, I did a lot of fun things and great things as a child and people that i know because of that without even realizing who they were at the time it's just really amazing speaking about looking back on it um as you've kind of learned more over the course of your life about what, what he achieved what are you kind of like most proud of in terms of him being your dad is it what he achieved on the floor or or him as a as a trailblazer, as as a guy who broke through barriers um, yeah. in a in a social and a cultural kind of way. It's definitely the trailblazing part. Um, I know he achieved a tremendous amount on the floor, and I would I'd love to say I could achieve that much on the floor. But I mean, it's probably it's too late for me. I can't achieve everything that he's achieved. He achieved so much on the floor, but his uh, trailblazing, being the first African American at Carolina, and kind of making that that pathway for the, the guys that came through there is uh definitely probably the biggest thing and then you know just being a being around at that time of playing basketball and knowing what he went through while in college and, and in the pros as well i mean being up growing up in new york and moving to carolina to the south at that time was very tough and leaving his family completely just to be in that environment to kind of better himself and you know being a teenager and having to see a lot of racism a lot of things that most teenagers shouldn't be seeing but he had to go through it he was called on at basketball games he um in college, his whole team had basically had to back him up a lot of times because people didn't want him at the school. So, I mean, um, the stuff that he went through as being a teenager, as well as going into his pro career, I mean, 
a lot of guys won't be able to do that. And just knowing that he did that kind of pushes me as well. I mean, for a lot of situations I've been in where I'm like, man, it's tough. I don't know if I want to do all these things. Then I realize what he's done at a younger age. And it's like, well, I mean, he was able to go into a world where he wasn't accepted, essentially. And mm. he fought, his, fought, fought through all that as well as playing back at a very high level. So I'm like, you know what? Let me just suck it up and do what I got to do. One thing I didn't mention there when I rattled off everything that that he did as a player um, was his time in the playgrounds in New York as he was coming up mm. and, and and building a name for himself. I mean, my understanding is he was getting some things done at the Rucker and the yeah. like. Did he, did he, most guys who are balling at a high level there get themselves a pretty cool nickname. Did he get yeah. one? God, man. I've heard, I've heard so many different things with him. I don't know if it's like one that just sticks with him. I know it's like, cause he's fast. They call him the cat. Uh, something with speed. Um, there, there's a few, but I don't, I don't have them memorized. Cause at the end of the day, I go back there and people call him those names. I'm like, who uh-huh. are they talking to? And I just, I'm like, cause he, he doesn't talk about us with us. Honestly, he doesn't really? be like, yeah, this is what I did. This is what I did all that stuff. Now my friends in college kind of caught on to it and they, they knew who he was and he wouldn't talk about stuff. So they would start talking trash to him. Then he would humble them. Then they would stop. But right. it would never be a situation where he would just start talking about what he's done or like what he's been through and stuff like that. So, I mean, it's, it's more when somebody brings it up or somebody asks him a question or even to the day, if somebody asks him, they'll be like, man, you look like Charlie Scott. He'd be like, yeah, man, I hear that a lot. But I mean, I'm not just to kind of just, I've read the just whole situation. And yeah. Just keep it moving. But yeah, I mean, uh, there's definitely some names I've heard while being up there. I just, but he never told us these things, so no. You have forged your pathway ever since kind of your college uh, at Ohio State and then, you know, some time in the G League, mostly overseas in Europe, now here in Australia. Do yeah. Does your dad or do you, your, your siblings, do they watch your games from back home and, and give you feedback? It's tough. It's tough, definitely. Um, in college, they were able to obviously catch every game because of that, that time zone. Um, and when I was in overseas in Europe, it's a little bit more manageable, but it's still tough at the same time. And obviously that figuring out those technology things is obviously different right. for parents back home and all that. But here, being 14 hours away is oh. definitely extremely tough. But they figured out that the games are on YouTube and they're able to watch it back and, you know, right. kind of kind of talk about it then. But um, I know in high school, my parents, my, my parents, my dad would give me feedback. My mom would tell me everything was great in high school. My dad <laughs> would give me feedback and uh, and – definitely talked to me about how the game was and all that stuff. Now in my career, he kind of said, you know, I've told you everything you need to know now. I mean, you have enough knowledge of what's going on. I definitely trust you and what you're doing. You know what you got to do out there. I don't want to go out there and be another coach for you. You've been around basketball. I'm 29. I've been around basketball for 27 years. So, I mean, it's Mm. not even knowing that I'm hearing basketball terms at the time when I'm two or three years old, but I've been hearing all these things all my whole life. So, He's at a point where he's like, yeah, man, I don't need to tell, talk to you about ball. I, he, he asked me more questions about basketball than he's more telling me things now. So, I mean, wow. um, yeah, it's just it's just a, an environment now, obviously, where he just said, you know what? You know what you're doing. You've been doing it all your life. I've taught you everything you need to learn at a young age. Just so now you don't have to come back and ask me for questions. So, I mean, that's kind of that mindset he took from me. And, and now 40's got you paying that forward. And passing on those lessons to the young, young, to the young guys. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess I got to be some, give out some wisdom when I can. I mean, I definitely try to throw in some little tricks and trades out there. But I mean, they teach me a lot of stuff as well. I mean, I, I just, they, they keep asking me. I know Juki keeps asking me how I get steals and stuff because I'm not fast. I'm like, you know, I just, that's just timing. And you just got to know how to read players and read scout and stuff like that. He's like, I don't know how you get there because you're not fast. But somehow you're always there. I'm just, read the scout, man, read the personnel and know what the guys want to do. And it's just little things like that. We're like, wow, I never really thought about it like that. But yeah, just little things. Hey, you know what else is kind of cool for you in the NBL is um, you got a whole bunch of teammates from that Long Island squad that you played with years back in this league. Um, obviously, yeah. Will Weather came in and now he's gone and Mitch Creek and Big Sauce and yeah. Taj. Am I missing anyone, man? Like Milton Doyle was on, that, uh, on the team before with me and Taj as well. Okay. And obviously, um, Craig Randall was on that organization. We never, none of us played with him though, but he was in the same organization. I think the year after we all left. So, yeah, I mean, it's uh, kind of the pipeline for I guess the NBL. That key. that eighteen nineteen uh, Long Island squad in particular was mm-hmm. was fun, right? That it was that. Where does that sit in terms of like the fun teams you've played on? I would say top three for sure. I right. I think. 
me and Tasha talked about it during that preseason. We think we had probably two, three practices. I'm like, this is a team that can go to the end for sure. I mean, we, it was the, it was so clear. We had just met Mitch. We got who is this Australian guy that's, you know, doesn't know anybody. And first practice, he's going hard, talking to everybody, being a vocal leader right away. Like, okay, he's mean business. Next day, Allen comes in yelling out of nowhere. It's like, okay, well, we'll see what he's doing now. And then it's just, we had so many guys that was just locked in and wanted to win and put winning in front of everything. A very similar to situation to the team we have right now in Kansas. Just, we didn't have guys that wanted to be that main guy. Our whole thing was winning. And we knew once we won, we would have a situation where every guy, every guy can go somewhere and have a, a better situation the following year. And that's what we did. Winning, he was a lot of that stuff and winning. I think a guy averaging 12, 13 on a winning team versus a guy averaging 30 points on a team that got three wins, I think that speaks more about how that player is and what he's able to do. So, I mean, I think we all had that mindset and mentality and we all took it and went with it. So, if, if Creaky hadn't have gone to Minnesota, do you win that title? Absolutely. Uh, I, I told them that I, I could have even play in the championship. My ankle was broken. Creek was gone. Uh, we had some – somebody else couldn't play, though. But, yeah, I mean, we – not try to say that we felt we were the best team, but we definitely knew that we were going to cause trouble in that, in that playoffs there. And um, definitely would have, I think we would have won it for sure. All right, man. Hey, to, to finish up, um, I know you got to go off and get a Sarge. You know, you're the old man of the squad. You got to look after that. I, I, that. I got to say young somehow, man. <laughs> <laughs> just to finish off, man. Hey, Forty's talking about, Hey, look, we're just going to, we're just going to focus on hitting our KPIs one game at a time for, for you. What is the next thing? Off the back of that win over Sydney, backing that up, what's the next thing you guys need to kind of get better at as you move forward this season? Um, building off the energy that we had in Sydney for sure. We, we can't we can't go backwards. We got to keep going forward. But um, at the end of the day, we got to treat each and every game like it's that Sydney game, like you said, like a, a big great team like that. Um, but we have a great understanding of what who we are the expectations of us, the, the perception of us that, you know, I think we still have that perception, unfortunately, that we're a team that you don't know what you're going to get. We're not a team where it's like, well, we got to be ready for them. We kind of still earn that respect to other teams, and we kind of like that. I mean, if teams don't want to really say that Kansas is a, a problem for us, we got to scout against them, we got to be ready for them, then we're going to definitely take advantage of that and go hard against all these teams. But um, we, we enjoyed that. I'm not going to say the underdog role because there's 10 teams in this league. Everybody can play. Every team is good. But we definitely try to keep it in our circle, talk to ourselves and like, listen, we got to do what we have to do. And then whatever the results are, we're going to live with it. We know the guys we brought in, we know our situation. We know how we want to play. If we do our things that we want to do, we're going to be in position to win the game. Not saying we're going to win the game, but we're going to be positioned to win the game. And if we don't do those things, it's on us completely. We can't let other teams determine how our games are going to go. So that's that mindset we're taking. We're going to stick with it. Nice. We'll go get that home win. You'll enjoy those that, that orange army if you get a win there. Yeah, the yeah, we, we got we to get we got to get playing well. I mean, we've been on the road this whole time except for one game, but yeah, once we get home, we just got to definitely uh, got to make it happen for them. Awesome. Well, good luck with that, man, and uh, and best of luck for the rest of the season. Thank you, man. I appreciate being on here. Thank you so much. Cheers. Cheers.